So as promised, um, it look, look, look again, finally we can uh, look at the 1980s where the peplum principle returned, sort of, because the peplum, these weren't exactly sword and sandal, but they were more barbarian orientated, but one can clearly see where the influence was um, for these films. And it's quite an eye opener that there are a lot of the directors um, who actually started this mini revival in the 1980s were also responsible for some of the original peplum in the 1960s. And another thing, surprising thing as well, is that a lot of these um, directors were actually linked to the video nasties as well that hit Britain when we had draconian censorship. The sort that they're trying to inflict on the United Kingdom now, but only using the internet as the bogeyman rather than the uh, VCR. Anyway, let's start off with this. So uh, Joe D'Amato, also known as Aristedi Masachesi, um, of the wonderful uh, sleazy movies he, pr he produced like Absurd, and my own personal favourite, the totally debauched but wonderful Emmanuel in America, directed a few and returned to this genre after being uh, part of the production crew or being behind the actual lens themselves in the 1960s. Um, 80s peplum up to the gore and nudity, so it can't really be bad. We mustn't also forget the influence that the Conan films had um, at the same time. So with the Conan films married with the peplum format, that gives you an indication on uh, what these 80s gems were about. So Diamato brought us Ator and Ator 2, 3 and 4, and Blade, uh, Blade Master. Um, Diodato, synonymous with the notorious nasty cannibal holocaust, brought us the Barbarians in 1987. Umberto Lenzi of Cannibal for Rocks, Infamy, brought us Iron Master in 1982, which is still cut um, by our British Board of Film censors today. Um, Umberto Lenzi, as the others, he already uh, cut his teeth on a 60s pe peplum originally, directing some of these films. I love seeing how these all link up. Luigi Cosi, um, he of Star Crash and the uh, wonderful Alien Contamination, showcased uh, Luferingo in Sinbad of the Seven Seas, and Franco Prosperi without Jacopetti of Mondo Carne and numerous shockumentaries galore, directed Gunan the Barbarian and Throne of Fire. And of course, the maestro of the macabre, Felucio Fulci, churned out Conquest in 1984. Now, from the influence of the peplum of the uh, barbarian films, we can now return back to something a little bit more sword and sandal, but something saucy sword and sandal. For now, for the sleaze, um, in the wake of Caligula, um, Tinto Brass's fantastic uh, 1979 feature film. People that are embarrassed, you know, the feature that appeared in this, don't be. It was absolutely amazing. I love the film. Um, it mixed melodrama, spectacle and hardcore. This spurned our dear Italians into making peplum erotica including Caligula, the untold story, um, with its vomitariums, violence, vaginas, and a new low with its uh, very own bestiality scene. So Caligula 2, the untold story, is, is definitely one to watch and is an eye-opener, and I enjoyed it just as much as I did Caligula, to be honest with you. It gives you bucket loads of sleaze and lots of violence um, for those who like the exploitation drive-in sort of flavour. Um, others were uh, Nero and Popeye, uh, Caligula Slaves, Caligula's Hot Nights, and Messalina and Caligula, all littered with lashings of the red stuff and a smorgasbord of sin by the sackful. So that rounds off our little journey that we've had concerning Peplum. So we started in 1907 and worked our way all up to uh, modern films and beyond. And why shouldn't we have uh, done that for a genre that has influenced uh, so much from its uh, genesis right up to modern movies and beyond? So 
looking at it, can you see how frustrating it is to know that this wealth of material has never made it to the British Isles only on their initial release? But um, for those of you that have been inspired by this to have a look at some Peplum movies, research into sourcing the best available print is absolutely vital. So these jolly romps can be seen in all their widescreen glory with at least English subs. So ensure that you source the best quality print. A few can also be viewed on Amazon Prime if you get the TV stick. In no way promoting Amazon at all. They don't need that. They're doing uh, fine by the marketing themselves. Um, but give credit where credit's due. Their Fire Stick is a must-have. And um, some of these films can be seen um, utilizing uh, that piece of technology. And of course, there's um, the Peplum TV channel on YouTube that's uh, definitely worth a dig about. So what I'm going to do now is to um, round off. Uh, so let's look, look and look again at a classic piece of Peplum that along with Perseus, Little Invincible, Machiste All Inferno, the 1962 version, and Hercules and the Haunted World, to name but a few, is a superb primer to savour and introduce you to the realm of sword and sandal and is just the sort of film to feature on our show. We've covered such a lot, but in true look, look and look again style, I have singularly focused on one of the best of these um, pieces of peplum magic just for you. Goliath and the Vampires is a 1961 peplum with Gordon Scott, and this is his first outing in a peplum film. And it sees Scott pitting his uh, brawn, because let's face it, many were not on screen for the beauty of their brains, against fang-toothed bloodsuckers, as horror is weaved with the sword and sandal staple to great effect. Gordon Scott was born Gordon Werschkel on August the 3rd, 1926. After a time in a variety of professions, Scott became a lifeguard and in 1953 was spotted by a talent scout in Las Vegas. Scott was then cast as Tarzan, um, taking over the role from uh, Lex Barker. It was in 1960 Scott left the Tarzan role and travelled to Europe where he secured his stardom in all things sword and sandal and became uh, synonymous with the genre just as Steve Reeves. Scott sadly passed away in 2007 at the age of 80. Scott is, I believe, now is somewhere on Olympus and along with Steve Reeves and Reg Park, I'd like to think he and the others have now become demigods in their own right, leaving them adventurous trademarks um, that we can see in their cinematic outings with us here on Earth. God bless you, Mr. Scott. So back to the film. Um, it was directed by Sergio He of Django uh, Infamy, Corbucci and uh, uh, Giacomo Gentilomo. I feel it is a uh, treasure trove of pure escapism, this movie, and a perilous peregrination at that over its 80 odd minute running time. The film it's always held a fascination for me, uh, starting uh, with uh, being enchanted by the lurid poster artwork from a young age. When I saw it in a magazine, what that magazine was I don't know, but going back then it probably would have been Starburst or something. Anyway, I found out later what actually features in the uh, on the poster actually features in the movie, which is uh, very rewarding, as you can see. Secondly, the film is um, executively produced by Dino De Laurentiis. This company had been responsible for two exceptional slices of psychedelic pop art with the uh, wonderfully sassy space trip Barbarella and Danger Diabolique, both bringing comic book to life and resulting in must-sees of cult cinema. When I first got my hands on it, I anticipated Goliath vs. the Vampire um, would not be a disappointment, and thank Zeus, I was right. Diabolique in Barbarella 
um, fitted well with the new but short-lived M certificate, which was brought in to classify films by the Motion Picture of America Association, and both didn't shy away from the sex and drugs element. Although Goliath and the Vampires doesn't feature carnal exhibitionary or toke-puffing, pill-popping bacchanalia, there was a little more violence on display throughout the duration. This is probably um, is owed to Kabuchi due to his, uh, his uh, graphically violent uh, spaghetti westerns, so um, you can see some uh, graphic bloodletting in this film as well. Instead of cutting away, um, Giacomo Gentilo and Kabuchi tends to linger that little bit longer to capture a few more drops of the crimson stuff than usual. Not overtly gratuitous, but quite surprising really. Gentilomo and Kabuchi steers away from the pure fisticuffs and embellishes the maison scene with a few touches of out and out sadism. Arrows pierce eyeballs, throats are slit verily, and there's a grand piece of guignol where a ship's galley chock full of nubile young maidens are uh, being bled to death and drained of their plasma to slake the thirst of the vampire master and power his faceless organic automatons. These faceless fiends add a touch of surrealism to the proceedings, especially as they are joined in combat by a unique, a unique race of um, uh, blue-skinned um, indigenous inhabitants. Gordon Scott plays Goliath here in this uh, incarnation, or Machista for the purists amongst you, and out of all his peplum roles, to me, in my opinion, this seems Scott at his actual best. Scott is also, and fortunately, joined by a first-rate crowd of supporting actors and actresses, especially the female villainess Astra, who commands misanthropic disregard with callish relish, relish and flippancy. Hercules vs. the Moon Men was another of Gentilimo's outings, and is decent enough too, but uh, compared to this is slightly inferior. Both Gentilomo's films do um, mirror each other with um, apparitional villainy, brainwashed damsels including our hero's love interest naturally, and the director's colour of environmental choice being blue. This dominant colour ensures sequences can be awash with fantastic hues of cobalts, aquas and navies, ensuring the alien, the ethereal and other realm style is never fully compromised. Being the 1960s, we were also treated to a surreal go-go dance uh, number as a bevy of beauties gyrate their navels to Middle Eastern beat number, sounding like a cross between Sid Dale and a bikini beach number. Persia style. Slightly out of place, but uh, impish hokum nevertheless, and uh, definitely something for the dads, I think. The feature film starts with um, Goliath ploughing the field, and a group of villagers run up to him and ask Goliath if he can save a drowning boy called Giro. This he promptly does, as we know Goliath is a good egg. So after doing that and saving the boy's life, they get on horseback and they go to return to their village, but they both recoil in horror as they witness their village is an absolute inferno. The village bellows plumes of black smoke and they arrive too late to prevent an intense ransacking. Goliath bids farewell to his mother after she slips away from this mortal coil after sustaining a fatal sword wound. Giro too finds out he is an orphan after both his parents have been slaughtered. They also note that the female population in the village has also been dramatically reduced as the women have been kidnapped for slavery and unbeknownst to our protagonists as portable blood banks for his fanged lordship to feast upon, Goliath and Giro learn that this massacre is the scheme of the unscrupulous, diabolical vampire Kobrak. Both pilgrim to the kingdom of the Sultan Abdul for further answers, but there is a veil of secrecy, as the Sultan lives in fear of Kobrak and cannot divulge, let alone rebel, against such a powerful entity, and can only submit to his will. 
Looking after Abdul, we are also introduced to Astra, who is a little bit of an Ilsa harem keeper on the QT. Astra is also a Cobrax mole, responsible for a few deaths due to, due to her shit dropping. Goliath and Giro learn the shocking truth. The young females have been harvested for their blood to satisfy Cobrak's thirst and fuel his blood-powered humanoids. Goliath and Giro join forces with friendly native Kurtik and make allegiance with a race of blue people when Goliath falls through the sands into an underground chamber in a desert storm. Goliath takes on the menace to thwart the malevolence of Kobrak, free his love Julia, and rescue the villagers from their enslavement and sanguinary fates. Goliath and his legion, as well as facing the arch vampire, fight his humanoid army as well. After facing many challenges and endurances of strength, Goliath faces his ultimate test as Kobrak changes his form and Goliath faces a combat to the death with himself. vampires has a lot going for it for sure even when the vampire is revealed it's not disappointing or hokey and other effects throughout are pretty decent thrills the featureless men also add to the hauntingly sinister milieu dear viewer you simply must seek this one out however it's a great shame this hasn't surfaced on blu-ray as of 2019 I know there is a DVD uh, print available um, where it joins up as a double bill with Goliath and the Barbarians and it suffices, however the clarity is washed out and it plays rather like two-tone, which is a great shame because I feel that there is a wealth of colour that um, Gentilimo would have utilised for this film and it's kind of lost. Apparently it's quite difficult. Um, most of the prints appear to be washed out, so this definitely needs um, re-striking from the 35mm and have plenty of TLC. I would love to see this in a Whistle and Bells release, to be honest with you, or maybe with another Goliath or Peplum film anyway. It would make a wonderful bedfellow, for example, to Hercules vs. the Moon Men, or better still, a Goliath box set struck from the original negatives, of course. May the gods grant my wish and uh, make it so, but until such times, we can have uh, to make do with uh, what's currently out there. The interesting thing also is that um, the trailer that features on the DVD actually appears to be better clarity than the, than the um, feature film itself, and it gives us an idea on um, how this would look um, if they were to uh, give this the, uh, the pristine treatment that it so rightly deserves. Well, that's it for Peplum. What an incredible journey we've been on. Oh, one last thing. To see a true definitive example of Peplum for modern times, check out Rome and the ultimate, which is the Spartacus Blood and Sand. That is absolutely superb. And also Gods of Arena. Um, they these uh, this television series has all the violence in it as well as um, sexual explicitness and to be honest with you the Spartacus program really did push the boundaries of TV and uh, you know that'll give you something to uh, get your teeth into and in my humblest opinion uh, dear dear viewer I think the Spartacus trilogy of programs is some of the best television I have seen um, up there with Game of Thrones, in my own personal opinion, so um, definitely check out the Blu-rays 
of uh, this wonderful, wonderful trilogy of programmes. So that really rounds it up for our um, peplum. I thank you so much for uh, joining me and um, I look forward to um, taking you on a journey into some other cult realms when you join me again in our next episode of Look, Look and Look Again. Goodbye. Responsible will pay for their crimes. Into waters abounding with vicious killers of the deep goes Goliath to reach the sea protected city of the vampires. Here, men die by the cruelest of executions. A beautiful woman is the devil's own temptress, exploiting the young and innocent. And justice threatens her with the most horrifying of deaths. Please, Goliath, save me. You can do it. Help! In the name of the Sultan, I declare you under arrest. Don't resist us. But even the might of Goliath is not always enough to match the black magic powers of Cobra.